We'll begin this series by reading the introduction, Proverbs 1, verses 1 through 7. Hear the word of the Lord. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Randy. Would you all please join me in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Father in heaven, this world changes so much and so fast. We thank you that your word and that the good news of Jesus does not change. God, this world has so much information to share with us. We thank you that in your word we find not only information, but wisdom. God, as we begin this study of Proverbs, we pray this morning, may your word come to us and may we be wise. Not only for our benefit in our daily living as human beings, but for the glory of your name and the growth of your kingdom. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, as you no doubt have noticed, is a busy morning. Uh, Not only do we get to hear from the Southwest Christian Choir, thank you again for being here this morning, Uh, not only did we get to celebrate uh, the baptism of Maggie Feikema, we also get to begin a new sermon series here at Calvary Church. We've been doing something through Lent up to Easter, and today we transition into kind of spring-summer sermon series, and we're going to be studying together uh, a word to the wise uh, from the book of Proverbs. I was talking with a, a pastor friend in preparation for this series, uh, thinking out loud, and, and we're kind of talking about what we, were, uh, what we were preaching on after Easter, and I told him, I'm I'm hoping to preach Proverbs after Easter. And his immediate response to me was, Ha! I tried Proverbs once. It was really hard. So I will freely and humbly admit to all of you this morning that even though I have been in full-time ministry for 10 years, I have intentionally avoided the book of Proverbs. Because this book is so intimidating It is so complex. It is so chaotic. There's so many different things going on. There is so little structure. It's hard to know what to do with this book as a preacher. And as a preacher, I have found that people tend to do one of two things when it comes to the book of Proverbs. First thing that people often do is they dismiss it. Lots of people avoid Proverbs. I have done this in the past. Lots of people don't read this book. Lots of people don't think it's really all that important. And and it's because it feels so chaotic. It feels so complex. There's so many different things going on. And sometimes it seems like the Proverbs even contradict each other. The book of Proverbs is long. It is often confusing. And so people just end up avoiding the book of Proverbs altogether. The second thing that many people often do with the book of Proverbs is they see it as a textbook. And many people think that if I can just read Proverbs well and understand it and I can actually follow through and do all the things that Proverbs talk about, then then I will live a good life, I will live well, and I will live wisely. 
And so I want to begin this series today by saying to you, to those of you who see the book of Proverbs as something that you would dismiss, I want you to know that the book of Proverbs is more important than you realize. And for those of you who see the book of Proverbs as a textbook, I want to say to you this morning that Proverbs is not what you think it is, and it does not do what you think it does. Proverbs, as Tim Keller notes, are not commands. These are not commands we're talking about. This is different than law from Exodus and Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Proverbs are not guarantees. They are not promises. And again, many people think this about Proverbs. They think that if I just do exactly what Proverbs says, then I will be a success. Then I will be wise. Then I will live well. As if these words are a guarantee. Another thing that we have to understand is that these Proverbs are often partial. They're meant to be read alongside other Proverbs. This is why Proverbs is so interwoven and complex and and chaotic, because we're supposed to read it all together, not just take out our favorite proverb and try to live out that one. Keller's definition of Proverbs is the simplest, clearest, most accurate definition that I could find about the book of Proverbs. Uh, Observations, Proverbs are observations about how life works. They are not promises. They are not guarantees. They are not commands. They are observations about how life works. So, here's what we're going to do throughout this series. We're going to go through, in general, we're going to go through Proverbs chapter 1 through Proverbs chapter 9. And the reason for that is Proverbs 1 through 9 are actually the introduction. So there's nine chapters of introduction to the book of Proverbs. And then chapter 10 through the end of the book of Proverbs is actually the Proverbs themselves, what we know and understand Proverbs as. All the pithy sayings, all the little sound bites, that's Proverbs 10 through the end. And so the sermon series operates with the idea that if we can understand Proverbs 1 through 9 well, if we understand what the book of Proverbs is all about, which is what 1 through 9 is about, then we will have the right context for reading the rest of the book on our own. You'll notice that there's a couple of weeks towards the end where we're going to be doing selected Proverbs, jumping around quite a bit. And and the reason for that is we're going to get a taste for what it's like to read a lot of the Proverbs and to see them alongside together and apply what we're learning from chapters 1 through 9. And then in Proverbs 9, the the author ends with an invitation. At the end of the introduction, the author ends Proverbs 1 through 9, the introduction, with an invitation to come and feast on the wisdom of God. And so that's how we're going to end the series and then we're going to celebrate the sacrament of communion together while we end the series. So that's where we're going. That's what we're doing with this sermon series. Now the question is, what's going on in Proverbs chapter 1? As we wrestle with that question this morning, I want to share some statistics with you. I think everybody here this morning knows that our world and the culture in which we live is changing at an unprecedented pace. Our world and our culture is changing rapidly. But how rapidly is it changing? How fast is it changing? Did you know that the number of internet devices on the planet in 1984 was 1,000. In the year 1992, it was 1 million. In 2008, it was 1 billion. And this year, the number of internet devices in use today is 30 billion. So five times the number of people on the planet. There are that many internet devices in our world. There are around 540,000 words in the English language in use today. 540,000 is about five times more than the number of words in the English language than the time of Shakespeare. Five times more words today than in the time of Shakespeare. 
It is estimated that a week's worth of the New York Times newspaper contains more information than a person in the 18th century was likely to come across in a lifetime. There are 5.9 billion searches on Google alone every day. This is 200 times more than in the year 2000. Several of today's in-demand jobs, social media manager, drone operator, app developer, data scientist, sustainability manager, these positions did not exist only 10 years ago. And my final stat for you this morning is that Amazon's Alexa is asked 7,000 questions every five minutes. What is my point? Information is more accessible to us now as human beings than at any point in all of human history. Are we wiser? Again, information is more accessible to us now as human beings than at any point in human history, but are we wiser? Because I think we all know today, especially for those with uh, one or two or three or four internet devices, we all know how easy it is to access information. And yet, our culture is starving for wisdom. We got all kinds of psychological gurus that we look to for wisdom. Oprah used to be one of them. Dr. Phil is currently one of them. TED Talks, I don't know how many of you have listened to those, but there's all kinds of good stuff in those. Podcasts like Stuff You Need to Know or Stuff You Should Know and The Minimalists. These are incredibly popular with people. Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life has sold over 2 million copies. His YouTube page has almost 2 million followers for 12 simple rules for following life. Rule number one, by the way, is stand up straight with your shoulders back. It sold two million copies. <laughs> At the 2018 MTV Movie Awards, Chris Pratt's acceptance speech went viral because he shared nine rules from Chris Pratt, which are somehow a unique blend of bathroom advice and gospel proclamation. Check it out on YouTube, it's pretty amazing. Information has never been more accessible to us than it is right now, and yet, once again, our culture is starving for wisdom. Why? If we have all this information at our fingertips, why is it we want simple clue clear rules for life? Why is there this drive to understand life, to know exactly how we should live, to have clear direction about what we should be doing and not be doing? Once again, I think we all know that wisdom is somehow different than knowledge. It's somehow different than the ability to access information, but what is the difference? Proverbs 1, verses 1 through 7, articulates what wisdom is, but the unique thing about this passage and about Proverbs in general is it's not very structured. Okay? It's all mishmashed together, and it's all meant to feed off of each other, and so I can't go bullet point by bullet point, verse by verse, to tell you exactly what Proverbs 1, through, through 1 verse 1 through 7 is saying. So what I've done is I've tried to condense seven verses of what wisdom is into four observations about this passage. So, number one, wisdom, says Proverbs 1, verses 1 through 7, involves discipline and understanding. To me, reading Proverbs 1, verses 1 through 7 over and over and over again, there is a very strong sense here of wisdom being very hard work. That wisdom is not just something you have or don't have, it's something at which we as human beings need to work. That we seek 
to understand. We try desperately to grasp. We wrestle. We reflect. We think. Tim Keller notes that Proverbs are like hard candy. If you bite down on it, there is little that you will get out of it, and you might even get a broken tooth. Instead, you must, real, you must meditate on it until the sweetness of insight comes. I love this analogy, and here's why. I want to submit to you this morning that this is one of the reasons why our culture has such a hard time with Proverbs and a hard time with wisdom, because many of us are not willing to do this. We live in a soundbite, ADD, ADHD culture, and many of us are unwilling to do the disciplined work of understanding, of seeking and trying to grasp insight. And in addition to this, verse 2 along with verse 7 carries with it also the idea that wisdom involves an openness to correction and rebuke. The book of Proverbs operates with the assumption that because you and I, because all of us here this morning are broken creatures, and because this world is not the way that it's supposed to be, that you and I do not see the world as we ought to see it. I do not know everything, believe it or not. You do not know everything, and we need help. You and I do not see the world as we ought to see it. And wisdom is partly the ability to say, I don't have all the answers. And so I need the advice. I need the input. I need the counsel. I need the perspective of others. And when I do something wrong, I need somebody to set me straight. This one, too, is really, really hard for our culture to accept. We don't want to correct people. And we certainly do not want to be corrected. And so one of the things that I believe Proverbs 1 asks us this morning is, do we have people in our lives, mentors, friends, family, who have the advantage point, the wisdom, and the place of respect to correct us? We need people in our lives that are willing to say to us, you messed up. Do we have open hearts to that correction and that rebuke? Do we welcome a trusted friend or mentor correcting us? If we aren't, and if we don't, Proverbs says, we are fools. Number two, wisdom involves ethics. It involves the discernment and discretion of right and wrong. Wisdom seeks to do what is right and to not do what is wrong. And I know that seems simple and obvious to many of us, but we need to affirm this one because many people equate wisdom with success. Okay, many of us do this with an understanding that if somebody succeeds in life, if they do well, if they make a lot of money, if they have lots of influence, we somehow think instinctively that they must be wise. Proverbs is saying very clearly here, not necessarily. Wisdom is not just about success. It's about succeeding with right and wrong, with ethics, with morality. I think it's important to affirm that someone can be successful without being wise. In fact, this is exactly what happens in 1 Kings 3 through 3 verse 9 when Solomon asks for wisdom. And for those of you who don't know this story, I'm going to go through it really quickly. God gives Solomon the opportunity to ask for anything that he wants. And instead of gold, instead of money, instead of power, instead of influence, Solomon asks for wisdom. He asks for the ability to discern, discern right and wrong. This too, I want us to see this morning, this too is really difficult for us as Christians in our culture. Because we as Christians, many times, we don't even realize we do it, 
But many times as Christians, we tend to think of most things in life as being right or wrong, black or right, very black or very white, very right or very wrong. One of the things Proverbs affirms again and again throughout the book is that, yes, it would be nice if everything was black and white, right and wrong. But that's not how life is. There are many things in this life that are gray. There is not a clear right or wrong. There is not a clear black or white. Wisdom involves the ability to look at a situation and to discern the best possible decision. Because things are not clearly black and white or white or right or wrong. There is so much in this life that is gray. Number four, wisdom involves guidance, listening, and learning. For some reason, we tend to think that wisdom is something that we have or something that we don't have. And there are some of us here today who genuinely think, I know best. I am smarter than everyone else. I don't need to learn. I know what I need to know. I don't need to grow. Proverbs says, wrong. If you despise wisdom and instruction, you are a fool. Does anybody know who this guy is? Call it out. Tom Brady. I know some of you dislike this man strongly. But no matter what you think about this guy, he's a pretty amazing individual. And a couple of years ago, there was a documentary series on Tom Brady called Tom vs. Time. And it, and it goes through the different facets of Tom Brady's life, documenting basically everything about it, including his work routine. This guy has been throwing a football at the highest level for 20 years, and yet every day for hours, he works with a throwing coach, and he works on his throwing motion. Shouldn't he have that figured out by now? No, of course not, because no matter what you think of this guy, he's wise enough to know that you've got to keep learning, you've got to keep listening, and you've got to keep growing. Proverbs affirms in Proverbs 1, but throughout the entire book, we as human beings do not arrive. We do not arrive as human beings, and we certainly do not arrive as Christians. And as soon as we think we have arrived... We are fools. Which leads us to the final verse for our passage today, the thesis of the entire book of Proverbs. Verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. What does this verse mean? It means that wisdom involves a humble trust in the Lord. When Solomon talks about fear, he's talking about a level of humility. It's not necessarily about being having terror, fear, kind of that sort of way towards somebody. It's a level of dependent trust, meaning that wisdom involves the ability to see that we as human beings and we as individuals, we need help. That no matter how smart all of us get, no matter how much information we have at our fingertips, no matter how much technology we have as human beings, We do not and we cannot see the world as it truly is. And therefore, we need God. We need our Creator. Proverbs, this is one of the main things we need to hear today as we begin this series. Proverbs is not meant to help us think as human beings that we can be successful. Proverbs is actually meant to do the opposite. Proverbs is meant to bring us as human beings to our knees. It's meant to help us to see that we need help, that we do not have all the answers, 
that we need our Creator. We need His help. We need His wisdom. We need His guidance. We need His presence. We need His forgiveness. We need His grace. Proverbs is meant to leave us wanting. It's meant, it's designed to leave us wanting for more of our Creator, for more of His presence, for more of His help, for more of His wisdom, for more of His forgiveness. But how do we do that? That's what we want to ask at the beginning of the book of Proverbs, and that's what we want to ask at the end of the book of Proverbs. How do we do this? How do we have a relationship with the creator of the earth? How do we even begin to understand what his will is and what he wants for us? We get God. We get his presence. We get his help. We get his wisdom. We get his forgiveness. We get his grace in his word that is Jesus Christ. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 1 that Jesus is the wisdom of God. He is the wisdom of God. That he is the physical manifestation of God's presence, God's speech, his word, and his wisdom. In that verse, Paul says that Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block for Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But says God, or says Paul, to those whom God has called, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. As we begin this sermon series on Proverbs, we need to understand this. Proverbs is the unfulfilled revelation of God's wisdom. And I'm going to say this again. I wish I had put this in the outline, but I didn't. Proverbs is the unfulfilled revelation of God's wisdom. Proverbs is incomplete without the person of Jesus. What does it mean to be wise? Well, we get that right in Proverbs 1, verse verse 7. To look to Jesus. To fear God in that way. To to look to Jesus' humility, to look for his help, his guidance, his teaching, his wisdom, his forgiveness, his death, and his resurrection. The fear of the Lord that the Proverbs author talks about in verse 7 is the humble trust in Jesus Christ. That is the beginning of knowledge. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? God, we confess to you this morning that we would love to be wise people. We would love to know everything that we're supposed to do all the time. We'd love to feel the confidence of exactly what we need to do at exactly the right time. But we pray, Lord, that we'd have the humility to acknowledge that we need you. We need our Creator. And we need the grace and the forgiveness and the wisdom and the instruction of Jesus. God, may we have humble hearts to accept that reality and may we have humble hearts to accept correction and rebuke. May we have uh, ambition to do the hard work of wisdom and may your spirit walk with us as we journey through the book of Proverbs together. We pray these things in Jesus' name.